Hi, folks. Okay, so this week we are on to our second major answer to uh, the problem of uncertainty, that is uh, skepticism. So in this video, I'm going to just try and talk in sort of very general terms about what skepticism is um, and why it is that, I, uh, as I say here, um, skepticism is the failure mode of infallibilism. So a certain kind, of, what I mean by that is um, if you try to be an infallibilist, if you insist on infallibilism, uh, as in particular as a claim about knowledge, um, and things go wrong, uh, you can wind up being a skeptic. I don't want to insist in this video that skepticism is a bad thing. We will, um, uh, as the story goes on, we will see people starting to frame skepticism as, you know, if your view entails skepticism, then you have done something very bad and you, you've got to start over. Um, I'm not taking that for granted this week. Okay, so first of all, what is, what is skepticism? Um, that's a word that gets used in lots of different ways. It's an ordinary word. We use it in regular life outside the philosophy classroom. You say, uh, somebody says something uh, that you have doubts about, and you might say, I'm skeptical about that. That's a totally normal thing. Um, there is a certain, uh, there's a certain slightly more regimented use of the word that isn't the philosophical one. So there are people who say we are skeptics, like you can subscribe to Skeptic Magazine. Um, and what that, that sort of use of the term skeptic uh, seems to involve is like trying to debunk uh, charlatans and hoaxers. So like Skeptic Magazine, um, as I recall, I had, I had an uncle or an aunt or somebody get me a subscription to this when I was a teenager. Um, I'm not sure what it says about me that I that seemed like something I would want. I think so, I hope something. I think I think they meant well. I turned out to not be as interested as I thought I might be because like I don't care that much about um, supernatural ESP people and why they're wrong about stuff. But that's what the magazine, at least at the time, was largely concerned with. Right? Somebody says um, I can I can bend spoons with my mind, or I can guess your uh, I can channel the dead and tell you what they're saying about you and skeptic magazine or th this kind of skeptic their concern is to go and debunk that sort of thing to say here's a totally normal non-supernatural explanation of how you could do this okay so those kinds of uses of the term skeptical are related but different to the um the philosophical use Sorry, I should say philosophical uses, plural. Um, we're going to see there are, there are multiple things that you might mean by philosophical skepticism. They're all kind of related, but they are slightly distinct. Um, I'm going to put a link in the description, and if I figure out YouTube right, it'll be on the screen right now. Maybe if I point in a corner, then I can make sure that it shows up there, maybe like right above my forehead, um, to another lecture video that I've recorded as a sort of introduction to skepticism in ancient Greece. Uh, for another module, my level three epistemology module, we spend quite a bit of time um, talking about ancient Greek skepticism. Um, the term itself, skeptic, um, skeptical, skeptikos, uh, comes from sort of late in the ancient Greek tradition, the, the later Greek skeptics, the Pyrrhonians, the followers of Pyrrho, um, call themselves skeptical. Uh, because of, uh, I mean, I think of it as a certain kind of propaganda. So the, the word in Greek means something like inquiring or inquirer. Uh, and their, their bit of propaganda is they say, uh, our kind of skeptic, we are the only people who are really inquiring into things. Why is that? It's because what characterizes this kind of skepticism is the avoidance of belief or suspension of judgment. So they say, um, when you believe something, when you come to form an opinion, that's how you close off inquiry. You're, you're wondering whether some kind of thing is true. You're wondering whether, um, use one of our examples from before, you're wondering whether um, everybody is saved when they die, or you're wondering whether, oh heck, some other kind of thing. Uh, what are some things you might wonder about? You're wondering whether it's going to rain tomorrow, and so you inquire into it. You go look at the clouds, you read the Bible, you do whatever kinds of things it is that you think gets you towards the truth about the question you're interested in. Um, the way inquiry ends, they say, or at least a way inquiry can end, is you form an opinion. You decide it's going to rain tomorrow. Maybe you look up like your weather app and it says 100% chance of rain tomorrow, 150% chance of rain. It's going to be raining all of the time. The flood is coming. All of my examples are turning biblical. Anyway, um, and 
on that basis, you come to form the opinion, you stop inquiring, you say, I've got an answer, I'm done. On the other hand, if you say something more in the colloquial sense, skeptical, if you say, well, sometimes the thing is wrong, and it says 100%, but that must be a mistake. It, I've never seen the weather app say 100% before. Sort of whack your phone a few times. I guess that doesn't fix smartphones. It works more on TVs. Anyway, um, you you know you refresh, you uninstall the app, you reinstall it, or maybe you you know go go look at another app. You um, you think this can't be right. What you're doing when you continue to inquire, when you um, are resisting the end of inquiry, finding new ways to um, uh, keep searching, you're arguably avoiding belief. You're trying to stay suspended. You're avoiding putting a, a line under things and saying, I have the answer. So, okay, the skeptics say there is this tie between uh, belief and the end of inquiry or between the suspension of judgment, the suspension of belief and continuing to inquire. So that's why they call themselves inquirers. Okay. Now, that's one kind of skepticism. I said that kind of ancient Greek skepticism um, is focused on avoidance of belief. So this is, we can frame this kind of skepticism as an answer to that first question um, in my problem of uncertainty. What should I do when I can't be certain? What should I believe? The skeptic's answer here is very much like the infallibilist's answer from last week. When you can't be certain, don't believe. The infallibilist last week, the way I phrased them, or the way I framed them, they say, when you can't be certain, get certain. That's not really an answer to the question, what should I, what should I believe when I can't be certain, right? If I can't be certain, I mean, the implicit answer there was, if you can't be certain, don't believe. But don't worry, you can get certainty on lots of things. So you'll wind up believing plenty of normal stuff. Just be careful about what it is. Make sure that you get the certainty first. Our skeptic here is just the flip side of that infallibilist answer. This kind of skeptic maybe will say, um, you rarely or maybe never can get the kind of certainty you want. And we agree with the infallibilist that if you can't be certain, you should not believe, you should suspend judgment. So the skeptic's answer, to, this kind of skeptic's answer to this first question is when you can't be certain, suspend judgment and don't believe. Furthermore, here's what makes us skeptics. We say this means that you won't believe very much because certainty is never or is very rarely achievable. Okay. That's one kind of skeptic. Here's a second kind of skeptic. Um, that, so hmm, when we talk about skepticism, uh, particularly as a problem that people are concerned with in the uh, modern and contemporary periods, remember modern in philosophy class means sort of roughly from Descartes on. So like post Renaissance, post medieval, post Renaissance. Um, we no longer live in the modern period. We're not postmodern though, because that means something else. We live now, sometimes people say contemporary, but that's confusing because contemporary just means at the same time. We need to specify we need contemporary with us as opposed to contemporary with some historical person we're talking about. Anyway, you will often see, um, certainly post Descartes, people defining skepticism as a certain philosophical thesis, namely the thesis that we know nothing or almost nothing. Okay, why is that different? I mean, maybe that sounds very similar to the thesis that um, you won't believe much if you only believe things you can be certain of. But here's why it's different. If we take seriously the recommendation that you shouldn't believe anything, you also shouldn't believe that you won't believe much, because you should suspend judgment about that, just like other things, depending on what not much means. But so there's, there's this conflict between uh, having a thesis and avoiding belief. Having a thesis, theses, philosophical theses, philosophical views, doctrines, these sounds like the kind of things that you would believe. So if we're saying don't believe, then it seems like you want to avoid that kind of thing. Okay. So sometimes we talk about skepticism in this way that I'm suggesting is um, characteristic of at least many of the ancient Greek skeptics who actually called themselves skeptics and said, this is a good way to be a philosopher. They say, what you should do is avoid belief for whatever reason. That's one kind of skepticism. Here's the other kind. It involves a certain doctrine or thesis or belief, namely that the answer to the question, what do we know, is very, very little. And maybe these two things are connected, right? You might say, 
Um, the, the right answer to the what should I believe when I can't be certain is just what we said before, that this means you won't believe much, but what's one of the things that survives that you still get to believe that you can be certain of? Maybe you can be certain that you can't be certain of much. You could do that. Okay, so first kind of skepticism just says we avoid belief. Maybe it says we avoid belief in anything at all. Second kind says, um, you go ahead and believe things. The problem with belief, the, the, the real problem is just that you don't know much. Maybe you have lots of beliefs. Maybe that's okay, um, but you don't know anything. Okay, so philosophical skepticism usually means one of those two things, maybe both. Can you be both? Whatever. Okay. So why does infallibilism lead to that kind of thing? Because infallibilism puts pretty strict conditions on knowledge. They say you have to, you have to have a lot going right for you to actually know something. You have to be able to be certain. Depending on how we phrase it, we might say, you have to have a guarantee that the thing you believe is true. Not just that it's very likely, not just that you've behaved responsibly in forming your beliefs or that you're a rational person. It's rational for you to have this belief, but it's guaranteed that it's going to be true. Maybe we say it has to be impossible for you to uh, be wrong. Um, here's another way of thinking about it. You, you'll sometimes hear in like uh, TV shows with courtrooms in them, maybe in real courtrooms too, I don't know anything about those, but in TV show courtrooms, you'll talk about proof beyond a reasonable doubt, right? That's our standard for criminal convictions. It has to be beyond a reasonable doubt that uh, the person is guilty. That's when you convict them. If you just think, you know, a reasonable person might have some doubts about whether they did this thing, um, then you need to acquit them. That word reasonable is doing some work. Okay, so when uh, the standard of criminal conviction on TV courtrooms is not any possible doubt, it's not Cartesian doubt, it's not this, can I imagine any possible way that this person might not have done it and yet we have this evidence, right? It's something like, what would a reasonable person, what's a reasonable person? It's probably not any of us because we're in a philosophy classroom and that makes you unreasonable, but like, the, the person on the street, the, the, um, some famous um, jurist or other says it's the, the man on the Clapham omnibus. You can draw your own inferences about whether this means the law regards women as reasonable. But anyway, what the man on a certain um, public transit vehicle um, would regard as a reasonable doubt. Those are the kinds of doubts that count. Other kinds of doubts don't count. The infallibilist doesn't say you should believe things that are beyond reasonable doubt. The infallibilist says you should believe things that are beyond doubt, any of them, even unreasonable ones. That gives the skeptic a lot of room to maneuver. If I can invent any kind of story I want, reasonable or otherwise, about how you could possibly be mistaken about something you believe, it might turn out to be pretty easy for me to show that you could be wrong and to say you should not believe this thing, you do not know this thing. So if the infallibilist fails to show that you can be completely certain of something, then infallibilism, that commitment to a, a strict standard of, um, of knowledge or of belief, is going to um, fall over into skepticism. When they fail, they wind up being skeptics. Now, okay. The next video, I'm going to give you uh, sort of a guide to your readings for this week. So you have a choice this time. You, I'm, I'm giving you a bunch of uh, recommended readings. Your required readings reading is pick two of these. So the next video, I'm going to give you a guide to some of these things. All of these are, uh, as I think of them, um, all of these are geared around uh, either trying to understand what skepticism is, that's what the Nagel chapter um, gets at, but the rest of them are each addressing one or another kind of problem for skepticism. Why am I giving you in the skepticism week not people advocating for skepticism but people arguing about it? Because, so I think, um, I'm going to extrapolate from my own um, biography to you, and it's totally unfair, and you can reject this if you like. When I was the age that many of you are, not all of you, but I think the following characterization applies to quite a lot of you. When I was 
in my late teens and early 20s. Um, I think I was pretty good at seeing when authority figures had clay feet. And you see people making too bold claims and saying, we can be certain of X, Y, and Z. And you sort of look at them and say, nonsense. Or people saying, uh, here's how everyone should live their life. And you, you can see, you're a hypocrite. What are you doing? I think I was less good. Here's the part that might be unfair. I think I was less good at seeing my own clay feet, maybe partly because at that time in one's life, um, you're still you're still shaping your own feet. You're still uh, deciding how you're going to live your life. Uh, sorry, this is turning into a therapy session. I shouldn't be telling you about how disappointed I am in myself. You'll probably turn out fine. Don't worry about it. Point I want to make is, I think there's a certain temptation, a certain comfort because of that kind of pattern. There's a certain comfort with just saying, I'm going to be a skeptic. People claim they know things. That's just because, you know, they're being they're being hypocrites. They're not being self-reflective enough. They don't see their own flaws. You think that that thing is certain. You are more certain than you ought to be. Hey, maybe nobody knows anything. How about that, huh? Okay, sorry. That was that was maybe a caricature of a, a certain kind of undergraduate student. So here's here's what I, here's what I want to do with the readings here. I want to suggest so that. Ah, oh, that might sound okay. It might sound, or put it this way, it might sound like a non-skeptical theory of knowledge is letting people off the hook. It's saying, sure, you're fine. There's nothing wrong with you. You know the things you think you know. But I think skepticism, if you don't reflect on it, if you don't take it seriously, is also letting people off the hook. It's very easy to just say nobody knows anything and just be done with it. But let's take that seriously. If you want to say people don't know much of anything, if you want to say people should suspend judgment and not believe things whenever they, um, lost my train of thought there, whenever they can't be certain, take that seriously. How are you going to live your life without believing anything? Is that something we can really do? Now we have to think about what role belief plays in our lives, our cognitive lives, our practical lives. Um, does it make a difference to your life if you don't believe things? Are you are you are you going to seem are you going to live a different life than other people do? Is it even possible? Um, also, if we say nobody knows anything, well think back to um, that stuff we did in the first week. So we had in the first week we had the the movie Come Sunday, which I think of as um, illustrating why this kind of the first part of the problem of uncertainty can be real tough. Um, there are cases where you can't be certain and you've got to come to some kind of a belief and it really matters. But the podcast, the High fi Nation episode talking about criminal justice, gives us a, a, a case where it really matters what the answer to this third personal question is. Does this person know what they're doing? Did they know that they were doing the bad thing, uh, that there was a law against it, um, etc.? If we're skeptics, if we're the kind of skeptic that says nobody knows anything, does that mean we just have to let everybody off the hook? Does that mean that no corporation is ever um, behaving recklessly or intentionally doing wrong or screwing the little guy? I mean, if the law says you are guilty of a certain crime only if you know what you're doing, would we take it as an adequate defense to say, well, nobody knows anything? I mean, who knows? Like. We thought that this was illegal, but, you know, we could be wrong. We realized that we have failings, so we didn't actually know that it was illegal, even if we thought it was. So, okay. I want to suggest this week, this is the, this is the, the theme I want to press on, that, um, first of all, being a skeptic doesn't come without costs. There are, there are problems you need to work out if you're going to be a skeptic. You don't get to just opt out of the problem of uncertainty. Skepticism is a response to it and not just a, a rejection of the problem. Thing one. Thing two, um, saying that nobody knows anything is not holding people more accountable across the board. In many cases, that's letting them off the hook. We hold people more responsible for things that they know they're doing. And part of the work of epistemology, part of the work of solving this second part of the problem of uncertainty is figuring out exactly what that kind of knowledge involves. Okay, I'm going to stop there. This is long enough. Uh, next video will be shorter. 
Um, I'm going to give you a guide to the kinds of objections that each of these readings are addressing. So you can uh, use that as a, as a basis on which to um, pick which ones you want to read. Whichever ones you want to read are fine, but do come prepared to uh, explain your readings to people who haven't read them, because other people will make different choices when you come to tutorial um, and the drop-in sessions. Okay, I'll talk to you soon.